Okay, um, <clears throat> so welcome to the first lecture. Um, some of you have met me before, I'm Dr. Sanderlands. I'm one of the consultants, uh, cardiologists at the Glenfield Hospital. Obviously I teach a lot of cardiology and I'm one of the assessment leads. So, so <clears throat> over the next six weeks, every Thursday evening sort of suits me best. I will be recording them. We will do a series of lectures to try and improve your interpretation of ECGs. And I, and I promise you that every one of you will definitely improve in your confidence, your understanding, and more importantly, your interpretation of the ECG. So we will start off by doing a basic signal tonight. So we need to start off with the very basics so that we can move into trying to interpret ECGs that are specifically bradycardias, any STT wave changes, um, <clears throat> narrow complex tachycardias and broad complex tachycardias. And so what we will do is test you with Kahoot at the end. So I have sent you some ECGs um, to look at at the end of the talk, which we'll do on Kahoot. Okay. The first thing to remember is that the ECG is very difficult to become a master. And evidence suggests that you need to do something 10,000 times before becoming a master, but, but you don't need to become a master at an ECG. You want to become competent enough that you're safe to treat patients and that you can answer questions in the exam. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> Obviously, students are going to learn at different paces, but hopefully recording the lecture, you're going to get, you can go back over and look at it. And I will set, tell you where I, um, so I'm letting more people in. I'll let you know where I put the lectures, normally in the Leicester Medical School website on YouTube. Um, so it's important that you practice. The more ECGs that you practice and try to interpret, the better you're going to become. It does help to have some context in the clinical years, but sometimes this can confuse students. So <clears throat> we're gonna do the basic ECG today, all the basic signals, and this will allow you a better understanding of how to approach my algorithm later on in the bradycardias, the tachycardias, and the STT wave changes. And as I said, we'll do Kahoot at the end. So uh, I'll let you know when we start that, obviously. So it's worth having that on your screen, ready to go later on. So the amazing thing is, is that the 12 lead ECG can tell you so much about what's going on in the in a person's heart. And just by scanning this ECG, it's, it's a normal ECG, but by having 10 leads, we're able to create 12 leads that we can try and interpret. And obviously six leads are made up of the limb leads. We'll look at that in just a minute. And six leads are made up of the chest leads. So you well know this already. The six chest leads go from V1 to V6, arching across from the um, right side and the fourth intercostal space, right round to the uh, axilla. Um, and we get six leads. If you want to do leads on the back of the chest, so behind the chest, which are seven, eight, and nine, you can do further um, ECG stickers on that, looking really for posterior problems. Posterior MI is a possibility. We'll talk about that at another time. By looking at the ratios between the right leg is your um, reference leg. By looking at the ratios between these three leads and the right leg, we can then generate six leads um, and the limb leads are created. The limb leads are important for determining the wave of depolarization in the heart and the, therefore the axis, which we'll talk about later. So, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, we have Eindhoven's triangle that you've probably come across before. So like I say, looking at the, the ratio between these leads and the right leg as your reference, we can generate six leads from three by looking at the ratio between the right, right, right arm, left arm, and left leg as well. And from this, we can generate the circle of axis. So your normal axis will be going between naught and roughly 
120 degrees or even minus 30 right round. But normally between one and two are going to be the most positive leads because the wave of depolarization, wave of depolarization will be coming towards leads one and two. Therefore, they will be the most positive. So when we talk about axis deviation, we will have AVL being more positive. That means the wave of depolarization is going towards AVL. And that will be left axis deviation. If the wave of depolarization is going towards lead three is the most positive lead, then we have right axis deviation. So I'll keep repeating that tonight to try and show you. The important thing is we have to think about the heart as a three dimensional structure. It's very important. Unfortunately, the ECG put in front of you is a flat tracing paper, but we've got to try and translate that in our heads to, to a three dimensional image. So this is a good representation of looking at the leads in the heart and seeing what areas are represented by the ECGs and the leads that you're looking at. So very clearly the anterior of the heart will be depicted by leads V1, V2, V3 and V4. <clears throat> As I said, the posterior leads of the heart around the back of the chest are V7, 8 and 9. So Sometimes when you look at V1, V2, V3, if there are issues, for example, with ST depression in V1, V2 and V3, you can get, you can, you should be doing leads V7, 8 and 9 as posterior leads to look for ST elevation, because otherwise that might get missed. Okay, so the leads V1, V2, V3 act as the surrogate leads for V7, 8 and 9 without actually physically doing those leads. So remember, look for changes. We'll talk about that again in more detail for the ST T wave changes. So also the lateral leads are made up of one AVL, V5 and V6. The inferior leads are made up of three AVF and lead two. And obviously this is quite important for obviously coronary artery disease because obviously um, we're looking at regions of the heart because supplied by coronary arteries, therefore certain leads of the heart will be affected by a problem with that coronary artery. V4R is depicted here as, as a lead looking for a pure right coronary artery, a proximal right coronary artery infarct. So sometimes you might find ECGs with V4R on. And lastly, to say the AVR is very high up on the right. <clears throat> So AVR will be negative in ECGs. Um, so because everything around the heart is going away from AVR, even the P wave, the atrium, and all the ventricle, so it should be negative. Okay. So remember, think about having a three-dimensional structure of the heart. So how do we generate a QRS signal? What actually happens for that single lead? And we're looking at the QRS now. So if the wave of depolarization is going towards that lead, okay, and directly towards that lead, we have a very positive signal. If the wave of depolarization is going towards the lead, but not directly towards the lead, we'll have a less positive signal. If the wave of depolarization is going perpendicular, so 90 degrees to the lead that it's recording, we will have a biphasic signal. It will probably be small and the positive and the negative deflection will equal each other. If the wave depolarization is going away, partially away, we have a negative deflection. And lastly, if it's going totally away, away from the recording lead, that's when you're gonna have your biggest negative deflection. The same for the P wave, but I'll talk about the T wave when we do STT wave changes because it's slightly the opposite. But generally for QRS signals, Depolarization going towards the lead positive, depolarization going away from the lead will be negative. So, how do we generate? Let's try and think about in the heart what is happening um, <clears throat> to try and generate our, um, cure, uh, our signals. So, to start off with, we've got stimulation from the sinus node. This will generate our P wave with contraction across the atria going into the AV node. So what is con conduction into the AV node is the PR segment. So if there's a problem with your AV node, the PR segment can be prolonged. 
because that's conduction from the atrium into the AV node is your PR interval. Next, when we're talking about the contraction of the ventricles, we have depolarization B just be on the AV node, down the right bundle and down the left bundle. And this will generate our QRS signal. And then at the same time as the depolarization has started, there will be repolarization behind it that will, will start after the Q and will finish repolarization at the end of the T wave. <laughs> So we know how our signals are generated now in a simplified fashion. We now need to look at the paper measurements. So we now know that one second, we should know that one second will be five squares, meaning each large square will be 0.2 seconds. And therefore each small square will be 0 0.04 seconds or 40 milliseconds. So that is important when we're looking at the signals and measuring the length of signals to see if there's a problem in the heart. So let's look at a very basic algorithm. So you're shown an ECG. You do not know what the ECG shows to start with. Then you should start off having a framework <clears throat> that you use every time you're looking at an ECG, unless you can get the abnormality straight away. So you'll have come across this before. This is well known about in ECGs. So we look at the rate. The best way to look at the rate is each 12 lead ECG strip is 10 seconds. Count the number of QRSs and times it by six. That gives you the heart rate per minute. So by definition, the bradycardia will be less than 50 beats a minute. A tachycardia will normally be something over 120 beats a minute. The next thing we look at is the rhythm. The rhythm might be regular. So the spacing between every QRS will be the same. Sinus arrhythmia is a phenomenon which is physiological, normally in young people, where when we breathe in and out, our heart rates will change. So it looks irregular, but in actual fact, it's called sinus arrhythmia. So there is a sort of pattern to the rhythm. And lastly, the rhythm is completely irregular. The spacing between each QRS is variable. I've alluded to the axis already and we'll go through some examples. AVL, if AVL is most positive, you can remember AVL, le, left axis deviation, and if lead three is most positive, then we have right axis deviation. Looking at our intervals, our signals now, <clears throat> so we'll go through this again with some examples. If our PR, int PR interval is between three and five squares, then we have it its normal range. If the PR interval is short, then look for a delta wave because it could be Wolf Parkinson White. Obviously, a prolonged PR interval above 200 milliseconds would be first degree heart block and conduction into the AV node is, is not good. The QRSs, we're looking at the breadth of the QRSs. Is the QRS broad? Think of bundle branch block. If the QRS is very tall and there's lots of muscle in that region of the heart, then think of left ventricular hypertrophy. Looking at the repolarization of the heart, a very sort of thumbnail sort of review is that um, the QTC should be around two large squares, two large squares around 400 to 440 milliseconds. And then lastly, STT wave changes, look for ST elevation, depression, or T wave inversion. Okay, so for the purposes of the, you know, the ECGs I show you, they are all recorded correctly. But what should we look at? What should we be looking at on the ECG to know it's recorded correctly? So certainly we should have a name on it. So whenever you looked at in medical practice, we should have an ECG with a name on it. Otherwise you can't include that ECG um, in the records. We're looking at the paper speed. So if the paper speed is 25 millimeters per second, how quickly it's coming out of the machine, because if you change that, you can make the signals look longer and bigger. And then the other thing that's important is that we have 10, millime 10 millimeters or one centimeter per millivolt is the signal size. And the filter settings are set at around 50 to 150 for a normal ECG machine. 
But for the purposes of exams, you won't have that written. It would just be um, an ECG. So let's try and have a go at working out the rate. So you've got the rate. You can go along the rhythm strip. I'll just give you some time to do that. So the easiest way is that this is a 10 second recording. We're going to count the number of QRSs now. So that will give you the rate. This is the ventricle. This will give you the rate. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So times that by six, that will get you the rate in uh, per minute, which will be 72, six. Um, did I say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve? Yes, seventy-two. Okay, everyone, clear on that? Straightforward rate. So, in this example, we haven't got a um, a, a twelve lead ECG, um, and we've got a very large spacing between every QRS. So an alternative way you may know or may have been taught before is to count the number of large squares between each RR interval. And so this one has already passed the line. So it's on the two. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then that one's there. So it's roughly around nine, probably nine large squares roughly. So 300 divided by nine, will give you the rough heart rate of 33 beats a minute. And just so you know, in this example, we've got sinus bradycardia, because it's the P wave that is slow, is not beating, but the PR interval is okay. The QRS is normal. P wave doesn't come right, sinus node fires. QRS and everything's okay. PR interval is okay. AV node is okay, therefore. And it's the P wave that's slow in this example. So that's sinus bradycardia. That's an alternative way of calculating the rate of looking at the RR interval and dividing by the number of large squares, 300 divided by the number of large squares. Okay, I'll let you have a look at this example to calculate the rate. Okay, that's 19 times by six, and that'll be 114 beats a minute. It's just about normal. And in this example, we have P waves before every QRS. And so this is a sinus tachycardia, sinus tachycardia, P waves before every QRS. So the rhythm, let's talk about the rhythm next. So we have to, we use the rhythm strip for our rhythm, the rhythm is looking at the spacing between every QRF. So if we look here, between every QRF, the spacing is exactly the same. There's no change, it's roughly four large squares as you go from each beat. And you can visually see that, that it looks regular and the spacing is between. And because there is a P wave before every QRS, P wave QRS, we know that this is therefore sinus rhythm. Okay, so sinus rhythm, regular rhythm. Have a quick look at this one. Okay, so someone's put something in the chat. There are two alternative methods of calculating heart rate. How do you... How do you when to use either one if they give two different answers? Okay, um, I think mostly for exam purposes, you're going to, um, you're probably gonna have 12 lead ECGs. Um, so you've got a rhythm strip on them and therefore you can calculate the QRSs and times it by um, six to you know, your 10 second ECG. Um, Okay, if you do it another way, because if you do it at the R interval, you're probably going to get, you might get a slightly different figure because you're only taking two beats to make that calculation. So um, I don't think either way you're probably going to be correct either way. And, and answers would be, you know, we'd accept an answer between 
for example, 70 and 80. If those students wrote that down, then that would be correct. Okay, I hope that answers your question. So looking at this example now, we've sort of looking along, we've got the spacing between the, the QRSs is sort of variable. So you're thinking it, well, it does look irregular actually, but there does seem to be some pattern to it that it seems to slow down and then it speeds up. But what's interesting is that there are P waves before every QRS slows down, still P waves before every QRS slows right down, then it speeds up again. So during the course of this ECG, this patient has certainly taken a deep breath, has changed their heart rate, has breathed out to lower their heart rate and breathed in to increase their heart rate. Now, because there are P waves before every QRS, we know it's the sinus node is driving this, and this is purely physiological and is sinus arrhythmia. But it is an irregular spacing between the QRS, but there is a P wave followed by the QRS. So this is not atrial fibrillation because the P wave is present and this is sinus arrhythmia. Have a look at this example. Okay, so again, we're looking at the rhythm strip or our ECG, and perhaps now you can really ascertain that this is definitely irregular. The spacing between every QRS is so variable, and as well, there are no P waves at all. And so this is irregularly irregular, and this is atrial fibrillation. So one of the things to look at on the ECG, how can you sort of say another reason why it's AF? This is just, so V1, the V1 is, is Obviously, where I'm pointing on my chest, V1 is here, the left, the atriums are high up in the chest. So you almost, this is what you see. This is the atrial fibrillation going along, then it conducts to the ventricle. Atrial fibrillation going along, conducts to the ventricle, atrial fibrillation, okay? So you can see between, that's the fibrillation occurring. So that's one way of trying to check that it's atrial fibrillation, but of course, you've got an irregular rhythm here, the spacing between each QRS is different and therefore it becomes irregularly irregular, irregularly irregular. Okay, everyone okay with that up to now? Any questions? So we are keeping it basic today. It's trying to build up your knowledge and make sure you're confident at these basic things. So when we move into the um, ECGs with abnormalities, but you'll um, be able to answer them quicker and go through my algorithm that I'll share with you next week. So the axis, um, let's have a look at the axis. I sort of alluded to it like earlier on. So we're looking at the limb leads only. When AVL becomes the most positive lead, we expect the wave of depolarization to go towards AVL. It's positive. So what you'd also expect is lead three in AVF are probably going to be negative leads. So that's the way that we can check with left axis deviation that AVL is the most positive lead, AVL -le, left axis deviation, but lead three and AVF are going to be negative as the wave of depolarization is going away from those leads. In a similar way that when lead three is the most positive lead, we know we've got right axis deviation and AVL and need one are probably going to be negative because the wave depolarization is going away from those leads. So there's a way of checking whether you're, you've got left axis deviation and right axis deviation by also looking at negative leads on the opposite side. So what does that mean? What does axis deviation tell us? Left axis deviation can be a sign of high blood pressure can also be a sign of left anterior fascicular block. So when the left bundle actually splits into two, it goes anteriorly and there's another segment that goes posteriorly. So when the left anterior segment is blocked, we get left axis deviation. So we'll talk about that in conduction system disease next week. The right axis deviation is a sign of left posterior fascicular block. Okay, but I will, I will go through that with you next week. Right axis deviation can be normal phenomenon um, in, in um, patient, patients. So 
what we have to look at carefully is that we're looking at the axis from the limb leads only. Don't confuse yourself. Don't look anywhere else on the ECG to calculate the axis. We're not looking at the chest leads. So limb leads only. And the thing that we're looking for is the most positive lead, the most positive lead. Okay. So in this example, if you look here, what is the most positive lead? You could say either lead two or lead one. Yes, probably AVL is the longest lead. Sorry, AVR is the longest lead. If we probably look at that just about, <clears throat> but it's negative. Everything is negative, should be negative in AVR. So if lead one or lead two is the most positive lead, then the wave depolarization is going between lead one and two. And we have a normal axis. A normal axis. Okay, so I'll just give you some time to look at this one. Okay, so what is the most positive lead? It's AVL. AVL is the most positive lead. Okay, I agree that lead three is negative and is the longest lead, longest QRS, but AVL is the most positive, and lead one is positive. So the wave depolarization is going towards AVL. We have left axis deviation in this example, and we can confirm that lead two, lead three, and AVF are all negative. So we know the wave depolarization is going this way, it's deviated to the left, and therefore that, these three leads become negative, and that's the way of checking that we have left axis deviation. And have a look at this one, please. Okay, so no prizes for guessing. Yep, lead three is the most positive lead. Okay. And AVL is negative and lead one negative. Yep. So this is right axis deviation. So lead three is the most positive. The wave of depolarization comes towards lead three, right axis deviation. And yes, AVL and lead one are negative, which is the way of checking that we've got depolarization going away from those leads. And therefore, these are negative. Okay, so that was right axis deviation. Any questions about that? <clears throat> Okay, so we're on to the intervals now. You probably should have some idea of the intervals and, and scanning, so you won't get ECGs with the record, you know, with the recordings of the intervals in exams. But on the wards, when you're seeing patients, you'll probably, you know, some of the ECGs do tell you about the intervals. So always check them out. Always check them that the computer is correct. So the first one that we're thinking of is the PR interval. I talked to you about that being the conduction from the atrium into the AV node. The PR interval starts at the beginning of the P, beginning of the deflection, before it goes positive. And then the R is the beginning of the R of the QRF. And so it should be less than five large squares, sorry, five small squares, or one large square. And therefore it should be between three and five, 0.12 and 0.2 seconds. When I'm looking at the QRS, we're starting at the Q or the R. There's no Q wave here because it's not going negative. <clears throat> so in this example, we're looking at the RS deflection. Okay, but it's still the QRS. Okay, so end of the S, beginning of the Q or the R, depending if it goes negative or positive. And the duration should be less than three small squares or 0.12 seconds or 120 milliseconds. So that's PR interval, QRS. So what about when the PR interval is short? What does that mean? So when we've got a normal sinus rhythm, the PR interval here is around 160. So there's four squares there, 160 milliseconds. This is normal. When we look at the PR interval here, my God, it's very short, very short indeed. It's almost 90, just over 80 milliseconds there. And then you can see this upstroke of the QRS. The QRS starts very early 
and this arrow is pointing to something called the delta wave. So when we have a short PR interval, it might be that the patient is young and they have quick conduction down their AV node. <clears throat> Alternatively, in this path, patient, they've got a pathway, they've got an accessory pathway, an extra tissue connecting between the top and the bottom of the heart where electricity can go down, making the conduction very quick between the atrium and the ventricle. Okay, so this is where there's a short PR interval, Wolf Parkinson White, Delta Wave. Again, we'll talk about that in more detail when we do tachycardias. So now we just need to look at the basic intervals when they might be increased. So again, I talked about conduction from the atrium going into the AV node, going into the AV node. Um, and when we look at this rhythm strip, we can see that there are P waves here. It's a very long conduction, then the QRS, and then the T, and then the P again, QRS, and the T, and the P again. So that's one way of looking at your rhythm strip and trying to see what's going on is to go across the rhythm strip and talk out loud to yourself and say what's going on might help you. So going from the beginning of the P to the QRS is very long indeed. And it's about 204 to 220, about 340 milliseconds here. So this is what we call quite prolonged or marked first degree heart block. Just first degree heart block, sorry, not too fast. So that's first degree heart block. Beyond that, now I'm going to show you this every week because I want to make sure that you know about left bundle branch block. So if you went through your normal um, um, algorithm to look at this ECG, you would end up having a QRS being broad. You can see here the QRS is very broad and it's larger than three small squares, okay? So it's about 160 milliseconds, four squares from there. To there. So when the QRS is broad, you need to think about bundle branch block. So we have two bundles that supply the ventricles. We have the left bundle supplying the left ventricle, the right bundle supplies the right ventricle. So what do we need to look, what features do we need to look at on the ECG to make sure we know which one is left bundle and which one is right bundle? Because it's then important when we talk about tachycardias and they might be in the presence of left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block. So the first thing to look at on ECG when you have a broad QRS, we can see that there's no rhythm strip here, but there's P's before every QRS. So we know that this is sinus rhythm. The best place to look is V1. That's the first starting place. So in V1 in this example, we can see very clearly that there is a negative deflection. It goes below the isoelectric line, negative deflection. And when we look across the chest leads, it doesn't become positive until V6 possibly in V5 a little bit, but V6. So this is typical for left bundle branch block and this pattern. And so when you see so many of these ECGs, you get to see pattern recognition and know that this is left bundle. Invariably, and most of the time, left bundle branch block is associated with left axis deviation. Okay, so AVL is the most positive lead. It means th two, three and AVF are negative. Yes, that's our check that we have got left axis deviation. In very, not always, but most of the time. So you can see the deflection here is negative in V1, and this is left bundle branch block. Okay, um, so what does that mean? So if we try and look and try and display to you what goes on during left bundle branch block and why do you get signals that are like this? So. Effectively, there are three things that are going to happen, three waves of depolarization that happen during left bundle branch block. So the square, the little white thing here says block, says that there's no conduction going to the left ventricle. So it has to come to the right first. And the first thing to depolarize is the muscle at the apex at the right ventricle. Okay, so what that means is that lead V1 and V2 are going to be very negative because they're probably positioned here. So that initial wave of depolarization is very negative away. Then we have a much sort of medium-sized depolarization here, as now the right ventricle becomes fully depolarized and starts to travel across to the left. It's the only way it can get there 
via the myocardium because the left bundle does not work. And so we start to have the signals going towards V5 and V6 as being positive. And then the last wave of depolarization, the largest part, the final part, goes towards um, V5 and V6 and might also go to lead one and AVL, which is point, which is on the left-hand side. So that's why you get um, only positivity in V5 and V6, and also why you get, might get left axis deviation. Okay, so we'll talk about these things when we talk about conduction block next week. Okay, so that's left on the branch block. Alternatively, pardon me. Alternatively, we were looking at other ECGs where the QRS is broad. And again, so when you look at this ECG, we can see from the start of the Q to the beginning of the S, we've got another very broad QRS. So it's not narrow. When it's narrow, it's like a pencil. Uh, someone's written something in the chat. Is, is there also left axis deviation or is the axis normal? Ooh, what was that ECG? Sorry, I'm, I'm, oh, I answered it earlier. No worries, thank you. It's really hard for me to keep up with the chat as well. I just find it because I don't have it. It doesn't come down on my screen anyway. Where was I? So we're looking at this example in the ECG where we have another broad QRS. And again, so we see that the QRS duration goes from there, sorry, from here to there. So we look at V1, so always go to V1 and look at V1 and see what the signals look like. Now we have deflections that are above the isoelectric line. And this is what we call, what I call bunny rabbit's ears. So you have a small bunny rabbit's ear before you have a big bunny rabbit's ear, okay? So small and then big bunny rabbit's ear. So this is what we call right bundle branch block. How can we check that we have got right bundle branch block? The best way to look is in AVL, that we have this, what we call a slurred S wave. That helps us know we've got right bundle branch block. And a similar thing in V6, the slurring of the S wave before it goes to the T is indicative of right bundle branch block. The major thing is V1 being positive. So if I flick between left bundle branch block, we see left bundle branch block is negative, right bundle branch block is positive above the isoelectric line. Sorry, my cursor's gone. Yeah, so right bundle above, left bundle below. So we can see this now in this sort of resume of right and left bundle branch block. Then left bundle branch block, we have a negative QRS deflection. It's all negative, it's greater than three small squares. And in right bundle branch block, we have the small and the big bundle rabbits here in V1, which is above the isoelectric line. Any questions on that? Okay. The next thing we need to think at, so we looked at the QRS being broad. The next thing we look to, need to look at is something called R wave progression. So again, we're looking at the chest leads and what you expect is in a healthy heart, because of the wave of depolarization, now you have to try and think about this in three dimensions, that the wave of depolarization sort of comes from where we're looking down into the heart and across to the apex of the heart. It's quite hard to try and show this on a flat screen, but basically your conduction sort of going this way. And so what you expect is that the initially in, in a normal heart, the R wave is very small. The wave of depolarization isn't really going towards this lead at all. And so the R wave is small. It gets bigger as we go across the chest leads as the wave of depolarization is going towards those leads. And there is a complex, which in this situation, um, it's called the transition complex, where the amount of positive in the lead is equal to the negative, or it's the first lead where the positive is greater than the negative. So it's called a transition complex, and it normally is around V3. V4, V5, V6 are normally very positive leads as well to check that we have what we call normal R wave progression. So again, to recap, we have a small R wave, as the R wave gets bigger, as we go across all the chest leads, just looking at the R wave, yes, the R wave gets bigger as we go across, and that would be normal. Okay, so let's have a look. What, what does it look like if it's abnormal? So R wave progression only 
um, relates to the chest sleeves. Only the chest sleeves. So we can see now V1, yep, there's no R wave. We'll probably don't expect it. Mm, okay, V2, yeah, there's no R wave. It's very negative. Oh, V3, no R wave, yeah. Okay, that's negative. V4, no R wave. So there's no R wave at all. And you'd expect it at V3. V5, yes, there is an R wave. And V6, there is an R wave. So in actual fact, what you can see here is that these are probably Q waves. They are Q waves. Okay. And so this patient has probably had an anteroceptal myocardial infarction that you can confirm that with the T wave being inverted that corresponds to the Q wave as well. So the anteroceptum has died. There is a Q wave. There is no R wave. And again, this would be an example of poor R wave progression. What are the other causes? You might find it in left ventricular hypertrophy. It may be because the leads have been put on incorrectly. Also in a dilated cardiomyopathy, you might see it, but it can be a normal variance. You can see poor R wave progression, but it doesn't mean anything. There is no issues with the left ventricle. And so the next thing we need to think about is when the R wave is very tall. And if you record an ECG according to the standard recordings, sometimes you can record and you can see that the QRS actually goes into the next lead. And so in this example, you turn down the settings deliberately, write it on the ECG to say, look, I've turned down the settings to make sure you don't clash with the other leads. However, for the peak teaching purposes today is to try and show this recorded correctly, that you can clearly see that the R wave is very tall and also the corresponding opposite S wave is very long as well. So these are S waves that are deep and tall R waves. So you can imagine then that this could be a normal variant in a young, healthy person. In actual fact, because there is T wave changes, there is T wave inversion, especially of the lateral leads, that these tall R waves are going to signal something called left ventricular hypertrophy. So when there is more muscle in the heart, there is going to be a bigger R wave. And that stands to reason because there's more muscle for it to go across. Okay, so tall R waves and probably coupled with deep S waves would be a sign of left ventricular hypertrophy. Also, in addition to these T wave inversions that are there as a repolarization abnormality. So again, looking at the chest leads, we can now see quite a different picture compared to the last one where the R waves are very small. Again, the ECG has been recorded correctly and the R waves are very small. In actual fact, there seems to be some alternation between the R waves. So it's, you can see the size changes a little bit. So one of them is a little bit longer, smaller, longer, smaller, and R wave is much more. That's probably the S waves there, sorry. This is the R wave, small, big, small. And so where the R wave is very small, you've got to imagine, well, is there less muscle? In actual fact, no, there's not less muscle. There's actually fluid around the heart. Okay, so the fluid around the heart impedes the electrical signal when it gets to the ECG lead, the sticker on the chest. Therefore, the impedance is lower and the signal is therefore smaller. Okay, so this is an example where the R wave progression is probably okay, but the R wave is actually small and there is fluid around the heart, such as a pericardial effusion. And that is confirmed by what we call QRS alternans. So the R wave is alternating between each bit as the heart swings inside the fluid as it's beating. Okay, small R wave. Okay, next we have to think about Q waves. So this is another branch of the QRS. And so by definition, the Q wave is always negative. It makes up about um, at least 40, it's got to be about 40 milliseconds or greater, and also has to be greater than 25% of the R wave amplitude. So in this example, we have that, we've got our Q wave that is about 80 milliseconds when we look at it again. So the length of this is over 40 milliseconds, and it is greater than 25% of the, so there's the Q, R, it's over 25% of the R wave. So again, Q waves will normally be 
associated in groups. So if there's an inferior myocardial infarction, then we'd expect to see, you know, that's established and hasn't been treated. You'd expect to see Q waves in lead two, three and AVF, which are the inferior wall. Okay. So when we're looking at ST T wave changes, we are looking at the ST segment. So ST changes, ST segment. So what, this is the isoelectric line. So a normal ST segment will sit at the isoelectric line and will rise up before the, just as the T wave starts, of course. So this would be classed as normal. What I try to say is, is that there's like a big piece of string pulling the, the ST segment down. So now we're below the isoelectric line. So there's our isoelectric line here. The ST segment is below, okay? So beneath, depressed beneath the line, ST depression, which normally you see in non-STEMIs. We're gonna go across to this one next. So now the string is pulling up the ST segment. The ST segment should be at the isoelectric line, but it's not. It's above the isoelectric line, there's elevation, and the ST segment here is above, signifying a STEMI. And then alternatively, what we, so the ST segment here is okay, but we have a T wave that's inverted, where it shouldn't be. The T wave inversion is a sign of a non-STEMI. Okay, so there are the ST T wave changes that we'll talk about in, in, in week three. That's just to show you as we complete our basic algorithm. These are just some other causes there you can look at for elevation, depression, and T wave changes. So just a little bit on how to measure the QT interval, um, because really you try to eyeball the ECG and have a look. You will never be asked to do this in an exam, so don't worry. Um, so the QT interval is important in terms of showing us about repolarization of the heart, but the QT interval on its own will change depending what the heart rate is. Therefore, if the heart is fast, the QT interval will be shorter because repolarization has to happen that much quicker. And the heart is particularly slow, the QT interval will be longer. There's more time for the heart to repolarize before the next QRS signal um, depolarizes. So classically, we use leads three, uh, two or V5 to calculate the QT interval. And we calculate the QT interval as a, comp uh, as a formula correcting for the rate. So we need to know what the preceding R interval, so this rate of the heart will predict this QT interval. This heart rate here will predict this QT interval. So how do we measure the QT interval? So it's the Q, the beginning of the Q to the end of the T, but we have to use a tangent line. So we're, we're not measuring this probably U wave here. Okay, we don't calculate that in the, in the QT assessment. So we make a line coming across the um, baseline isoelectric line, and that's where our end of our T wave is. Okay, so we put it into a formula, which is the QT interval um, divide in milliseconds divided by the square root of the R interval. So if your heart rate is 60, your R interval is one. Okay, so that's just a bit of information about that you don't need to know, but specifically the QT interval should be roughly two large squares for most given heart rates. There are some confounders when the QT interval is prolonged. So certainly it could be long QT, but we see that the QT interval is increased uh, during a myocardial infarction or during ischemia, certainly during structural heart disease or where there's left ventricular hypertrophy. Of course, when the QRS is prolonged, we expect the QTC to be prolonged in the same proportion. So in left and right bundle branch block, specifically where the salts are low, um, in diabetic ketoacidosis and class three antiarrhythmics are going to prolong the QT interval. And on the other side of the coin, the reduced QT interval will be associated with hypercalcemia. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll just do a couple, of, um, just go through a couple of example ECGs, use the algorithm, rate rhythm axis, you know, intervals, 
PR, QRS, QT, and STT wave changes. And then we'll walk and talk through these examples and then we'll move to Kahoot. So I'll just give you a minute to have a look at that ECG and uh, just go through. Okay, <clears throat> so it's a 12 lead ECG. We don't know who it's from, but we assume it's recorded correctly. So the rate, so let's work, work out the rate two ways. Let's do the two ways. So we've got, we've got a bit of a baseline artifact here. That's nothing, it's the way the ECG has been recorded. So the other, one way is to go count up the QRS is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Okay. So we've got a rate of um, 66 beats a minute, six times 11 is 66. <clears throat> so if we then look at the spacing between say this QRS and this QRS, we've got one large square, two, three, four, so five. So 300 divided by five will be 60. So of course, just on that bit, the heart rate is 60. Um, and but over, over all the 10 seconds, you've got this QRS comes in at a rate of 66. So either is correct. Either would be correct. So we know that we've got sinus rhythm. We've got a P wave before every QRS T. And so, and the spacing between every single QRS looks roughly the same. So we have a regular rhythm and we've got sinus rhythm. Okay. So sinus rhythm, 66, regular. So next we go to the axis. Let's concentrate on our chest leads now. So we want to know what is the most positive lead. So you either say one or two is the most positive. Then we've got a normal axis. That's all you need to know. We don't need to know how it's minus 20 minus, you know, we just need to know the axis is normal. And really what we're looking for is AVL massively positive. Is it left axis deviation? Is lead three massively positive to say that it's right axis deviation? It's another way of looking at it. So we have a normal axis. We have a PR interval that's normal, okay? It's less than five small squares. We have a QRS that's narrow, less than three small squares. And we have a QT interval that is around. So I try to look at one, so like here, when it's the start of a line and then go across and the end of the T. So it's within two large squares. We've got a normal QT interval. QRS, we've got an R wave that's starting that's very small. And as we go across, it gets bigger. We have a transition complex at V3 because it's positive and negative together. And then V4, V5, V6 are all positive as we'd expect. So we have a normal R wave progression. Are there any T wave changes? Yes, there are T wave changes in AVR, but everything is negative in AVR. So T wave inversion AVR. And there is T wave inversion in lead three. Again, that is normal on its own. I'll talk to you about that in the T wave changes week. Okay, so this is an, a normal ECG. Okay. Um, have a look at this example. Again, try not to look at these. Something in the chat. How do you know if the axis is normal? Okay. Um, I'd have to show you that. I need to go back. Axis, how do we know the axis is normal? So this is just an example here. I mean, that's taken from that ECG you just looked at. So when we're looking at the axis, we're looking at the, the limb leads, just to recap. So we're looking at the limb leads only. We're looking for the lead that's most positive. And that's because the wave of depolarization will be going towards that lead. 
Okay, anything that's going towards the lead will be positive. Anything going away from the lead, there'll be a negative QRS. So if any wave of depolarization in the limb leads is going to, towards lead one or lead two or even AVF, these leads are going to be the most positive leads. Wave of depolarization normally comes this way. One and two will be positive. Okay, so AVR is definitely going to be negative if it's normal. And so the range between minus 30 and 120 would be normal, but it's normally around here that would be classed as a normal axis. Okay, so that's how we know it's normal. So we look at this ECG, we look at the limb leads, we've got the most positive lead of either lead one or lead two. They, they look pretty much the same, perhaps. Lead one might be just slightly, slightly larger, but it doesn't really make any difference. So the most likely thing is the wave of depolarization is going this way between one and two, and it's in the normal range. Okay, hope that answers that question. Sorry to flash through this. Okay, just walk and talk yourselves through this one. Okay, so I'll just give you some time to look at this one. Or should we just walk and talk through it? Okay, so yeah, okay, the rate's 51 there. Interesting how the computer makes it 51, but let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's nine. So that's uh, 56 beats a minute. So that's different to what the computer's saying. And if we look at the spacing between all the R intervals, so we've probably got one, two, three, four, five, five and three quarters. Blimey, what's 300 divided by five and three quarters? I have to look at that. 300 divided by five and 0.75, 52.17. So it's, they're all roughly around the same. They're not absolutely the same, but they're all around the same ballpark. So the computer's saying 51, the R interval saying 52, and the other way is saying 56. So roughly the same. Okay, so we've got spacing between every QRS is the same. So we have a regular rhythm. We've got P waves before every QRS. So we have sinus rhythm. Spacing is the same. Okay, now we need to look at our axis. Okay, so what is the most positive lead? It is lead two. So we know we're okay, that's normal. Okay, now we look at our intervals. Pure interval is just at the upper limit of normal. Okay, five squares, small squares. The QRS is narrow. And the way of checking that is you could put a pencil over that and it disappears. If the pencil is put over it. QRS is very narrow, narrow QRS. Now we come to the R wave. So the R wave is very small in V1, very small in V2, small but getting bigger in V3, but then suddenly jumps to V4 being very positive. So that's probably okay. If you put a sticker, uh, an ECG lead between V3 and V4, and you called it V3.5, you'd probably find that transition complex. Does anyone understand that? You've got a jump here between um, V3 being, okay, the R wave's getting bigger, but it's mostly negative, jumping towards being very positive in V4. So it's probably between V3 and V4. So the R wave's probably okay. Again, the QT interval, the easiest way to look at the QT interval is try to pick a lead that's at the beginning of the lot on the line and then go across. Yeah, there's two large squares there. That's probably okay. Are there any T wave changes? Yep, T wave, a little bit of inversion in V1, which is normal. It's always negative in AVR, so that's normal. And there's T wave inversion in V3, which is normal on its own. Okay, so that's another example of a normal ECG. I think there's there one more. Yeah. Question in the chat. Where should the R transition be? V3 is normal. V3 is normal. But in that example I just showed you, it, it was between V3 and V4, which again would be normal because V4 was very positive. You're welcome. Okay, so let's walk and talk through this one. I'll just give you some time to have a look at it. Would it be counted as bradycardia in that example? Mm, good question. Borderline. Borderline. 
Yeah, this is actually my ECG. <laughs> so my heart rate was 51 when it was taken. So um, I must have spilt my lunch on it. So this is back in 2016. Um, yeah, it's borderline. It all depends on the patient and symptoms. So this is, I, I've not got any heart symptoms and I just did an ECG just to see. Um, so it depends on the symptoms. Normally bradycardia is less than 50, normally. Okay, so when we look at this example, slightly different. So 12 lead ECG, assume it's recorded correctly. We'll look at the rate, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So again, it's uh, 66 beats a minute if you use that um, way of looking at it. So when we look at the QRSs, the spacing between every QRS is variable. So it gets shorter, longer, shorter, longer, and it's irregularly irregular. Um, okay, so this is possibly atrial fibrillation. And this is when we can see, when we do see fibrillatory activity occur, that's a T wave, that's another T wave, but there's fibrillation going on all the time, conducting to the ventricle, QRS, T wave. So you can see this fibrillatory activity, it's not flutter, because every, one, every bit doesn't look the same. It's very flatter there. And again, in V1, you can see this fibrillation activity. So irregularly regular rhythm, atrial fibrillation. So we go to the axis, what is the most positive lead? Lead two, okay, that's normal. We can't measure the PR interval because there isn't a P wave, we've got fibrillation. So we have a narrow QRS. So let's come on to the R wave progression. So it's negative there negative there. Ah, now we've got a transition complex. It's mostly positive, well, just about positive equals negative. And then we move to V4 and the positive is greater than the negative, positive, positive. So that's a normal R wave progression again. We're looking at the QT interval. So as I said, I try to go, it's quite an irregular rhythm, but otherwise it's within two large squares. So start of a line, measure the Q or the R, to the end of the T is within two small squares, two large squares, which is fine. And are there any T wave changes? T wave inversion AVR is expected. No others. So again, this is atrial fibrillation with a rate of 66 beats a minute, otherwise normal. Any questions? So remember, when you get an ECG, you, don't, you can't see what it definitely is to start with. Go through your sort of standard protocol, look at the name on the ECG if you're on the wards, make sure it's recorded correctly. Look at the rate, rhythm axis, then look at the intervals. Okay, look at the r wave progression on the chest leads and then scan for any ST segment T wave changes. And then lastly, the QT interval. So if you do this, you keep practicing this with lots of ECGs, you will get to an answer. So when the rate is slow, it's a bradycardia. We'll do bradycardias next week. When the rate is fast, it's a tachycardia. We'll do tachycardias in weeks four and five. And then lastly, are there any ST segment changes or T wave changes to suggest it might be structural heart disease or an acute coronary syndrome? So you just stick to the protocol and you'll get to an answer. Okay, right, so any questions at all? So if we go to Kahoot, so I've given you the ECGs to practice. Now, unfortunately, with years of using Kahoot, it is um, very hard to, um, blimey, wasn't it? So you better be quick to sign in. Oh, chat. With a heart rate of 66 beats a minute, why is it atrial fibrillation? I thought AF is related to SVTs. So good question. No, the, the rate, atrial fibrillation occurs in the top chamber in the atrium. 
and the rate is determined by how much atrial fibrillation conducts through to the ventricle. And in that example of that ECG, it was only 66 beats a minute. So it's either that they've got medication on board to slow their ventricular response, slow conduction through the AV node, or the patient might be more elderly and their AV node is not very good. So they're in rate controlled atrial fibrillation without the need for any medication. Okay, so atrial fibrillation can be fast, but that's the ventricular response. AF is always fast in the atrium. It's always, the atriums are going 300 beats a minute in AF all the time. It depends on the conduction through the AV node, whether it's AF with fast ventricular response or AF with slow ventricular response. Okay, so if you want to play along, then, um, okay, no worries. Um, if you want to play along, then I'm just going to start this one, but I'll show you the ECGs before every question because it's you won't see it on Kahoot. So we log into Kahoot and then there's a, but otherwise if you don't get to log in, then um, you can watch anyway. Just make sure all your mics are off for me, please. Thank you. Okay, so does the rate of AF influence whether or not the patient has symptoms or not? Yeah, good question again, that's good, yes. If the rate is slower, then perhaps the patient may not have any symptoms at all. And this is the first time they present where it gets diagnosed is when they've unfortunately had a stroke. So they've got AF, they have a stroke, oh, you've got atrial fibrillation, the heart rate's only 66, oh, I didn't have any symptoms, yeah, that's possible. So yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so you're all joined in. So I just need to uh, new share. So hopefully you can see this now. So on this ECG, you're gonna have to calculate the rate. Calculate the rate. That's question one. Calculate the rate. Okay, let's get started. Fifty four. Oh, did I say? Six nines are 54. Did I get it wrong? <laughs> My math is not good. So 54, yeah. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Five, six nines are 54. Is that right? <laughs> Senior moment. Fifty-four. I was wrong. Yeah, fifty-four. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, question two. We have to do it this way around. But on Zoom, um, you'll never see it on Kahoot. I've learned over the years. So now, calculate the rate.
calculate the rate. Yeah, so 220. Okay, just to have a look. I mean, the, the thing about this is, this ECG, is that it's a tachycardia. Uh, so when we talk about tachycardias, we'll go through a process of looking. It's a tachycardia, it's regular, it's narrow complex. So you try to you know get to a diagnosis. So if you, I think you count 38 across, you could get something like 220, 228, and that's how you get the rate. So it's, it's, it's I try to put four rates there to, that are quite different, um, but it is about 220. But the main thing about it is that it's a tachycardia. Okay. Okay. So question three, and then question four relate to the CCG. So I'm just going to show you what is the rate which limb lead is most positive. Sorry. There we go. What, what is the rate which limb lead is most positive? What is the axis? What is the rate which limb lead is most positive? What is the access? You should have all these ECGs. I didn't send you them. I hope you got them. Yep. Six sevens of forty two. Yep, lead two. What is the axis? So um, it's normal, normal axis. I think these are just leftward, no, in, rightward, no, inward is just an unheard name. So it's a normal axis. It's not rightward, okay? Lead two is the most positive. To be right axis deviation, you'd have to have lead three is the most positive lead. Lead three, okay? Um, Okay, next ECG, which limb lead is most positive? What is there for the axis? Which limb lead is most positive? What is there for the axis? Oh, 
which limb lead is most positive, what is there for the axis? AVL, most positive. Yep. Left axis deviation, well done. Okay, on this example, again, which limb lead is most positive? What is there for the axis? Which limb lead is most positive? What is there for the axis? Yep, so lead three is the most positive. Yep, so right axis deviation, right with axis, because lead three is the most positive. Yep, well done. So we just, it's all very basic stuff, but we just need to go through this. So what is the rhythm? Should be glancing quickly. What is the rhythm? Yeah, very good. Regular. Spacing between every QRS is the same. What is the rhythm now? Number 11. Just someone turn off your microphone, please. Just thank you. Okay, I, I realize now in actual fact, the rhythm probably is irregular, but specifically it is sinus arrhythmia. So yeah, so perhaps <laughs> both of you are right, <laughs> but it is sinus arrhythmia. Why is it sinus arrhythmia? Because there's P waves before every QRS, but it is strictly speaking an irregular rhythm. I'll, I'll change that question. Just turn off your microphone, please. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> right. So next question. Hopefully you can see that. What is the rhythm? Question 12. Question 12. 
great. Yeah, so it's clearly irregular, and this is atrial fibrillation. Okay, so don't panic. You just need to, what is the rhythm? So I'll put this in for a reason. What is the rhythm? What is the rhythm? I don't want you to get the diagnosis, just focus on the rhythm. What is the rhythm? Yeah, regular. So you don't need to panic. Yes, it's a broad complex tachycardia, but it's regular rhythm, regular. The spacing between every single signal is the same. Good. What is the rhythm? What is the rhythm? Yeah, so it's regular, okay, it's regular. The spacing between each QRS is the same. The other way of looking at this actually, another tip is within a given lead, the QRS looks the same height. Can you see that? They all sort of match each other. So the height of the QRS, you know, is the same in every given lead. That sort of tells you that it's regular as well. So you don't sort of have to look at the spacing. Um, So if you, have I got another one? Yeah, so I'm just trying to show you as an example. So here, when we know the rhythm is irregular, look at the heights within a given need. The height of the QRS is variable in atrial fibrillation when the rate is faster. So you can see, look at the height of the QRS in this rhythm. See it changes? That's another pathognomonic feature of atrial fibrillation, variable QRS heights within a given lead most of the time. So in a given lead, you get varying QRS heights, irregular rhythm. Okay, question 15, what is the rhythm? What is the rhythm? in the chat. What causes the QRS complexes to go above or below the isoelectric line? I think that's just the way it's recorded. Um, it's, it's artifact. I don't think there's a specific cause. It's the way the machine is. Did the patient move? Oh, I see in that ECG. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, possibly in this, in this one. I think you mean here, yeah, possibly. Or the way it came out, the machine possibly may have, um, that's, it's an artifact. Yes, good. Okay, nearly done, 15. Yeah, so here's the rhythm. What is the rhythm? Okay, thank you, yeah, no worries. So... Okay, question 15, what is the rhythm? So this is irregular, irregular. Now, if you were sort of spotting, try to have a look at this, um, you can see that there's left bundle branch block and it's irregular. So this is atrial fibrillation in the presence of left bundle branch block. So it's a broad QRS, so it doesn't have to be VT. It doesn't become positive until V5 and V6 and you have left axis deviation. The rhythm is irregular. The heights of the QRS sort of vary within a given lead.
so question 16 should see on Kahoot. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, so it's normal. And, and that's why hopefully it wasn't too bad to see, but the pair interval is normal. I try and show you beforehand. That's why I show you, send you the ECGs. Um, so apologies if you don't see that very well, but it was a normal one. So ECG 11, sorry, 17. What is the PR interval? And use lead AVL as an example, the best example. What is the PR interval? Yeah, so it's a short PR interval. Okay, short PR interval. Let's go back to the ECG. It's probably easier to see. Okay, so we're looking at the beginning of the P to the beginning of the R in AVL. So let's make this even bigger for you. Okay, so we're looking at lead AVL. We're starting the beginning of the P to the beginning of the R. You can see if it's one, two, just less, it's about 110 milliseconds. It's less than three small squares, and that's short. And then you've got the delta wave to signify Wolf Parkinson White. So it's a short PR interval. And here's the last PR interval. What is the PR interval? What is the PR interval? Long PR interval. Well done. So now into questions about the QRS. Nearly done. What is the QRS width? What is the QRS width? What is the QRS width? Yeah, so narrow, let's just go and have a look at this. So look, it's a very narrow, it's less than three. You can put this sort of pencil over that and you cover up all the QRS. Okay, pencil goes over that, it's a narrow QRS, okay? On all of them, very narrow, less than three small squares, narrow. What is the QRS width? What is the QRS width? Yeah, well done. Very good, broad. I think there's just one more QRS. So what is the QRS width? What is the QRS width? Good. Sorry, there's one more on QRS. <laughs> Well, 
what is the KRS width? Broad, very good. So you can see it's broad. That's a broad QRS, greater than three small squares, broad QRS. Yeah. Last two about the R wave. I'm just going to. What, describe the R wave, describe the R wave. Generally, describe the R wave. Yep, tall. Yep, the R wave there is very tall. It's going into the next ECG segment. It's very tall, suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. And finally, describe the R wave. Looking at the chest leads, it doesn't really matter where you look. Describe the R wave. Yeah, short, the short PR interval. Okay. So when you're looking, it's very small. And this is indicative of fluid around the heart and the R wave is smaller. Well done, Delta. Okay, uh, any questions at all? I can't see the chat. Okay, I hope that was useful. We're building up the sort of basic ECG um, sort of signals and whether it's broad, narrow, tall and short. and. Uh, Next week, we'll do Braddy Cardi's six o'clock. See you then.